Good morning. We welcome you to First Baptist Church this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. Glad to have the live stream with us again this morning. Let's look at the opportunities in our churches today. Have Sunday school right after morning worship, and tonight at 6 o'clock will be the Chrismon service. Tuesday, we'll have all the board meetings. Wednesday, there'll be no community dinner. 6 p.m. will be choir, 7 will be the business meeting. And then Friday, December 9th, we'll, the seniors will have a luncheon here at the church. The 9th. It's Friday the 9th. Offering envelopes are available for 2023. They're located out here on the coat rack in the educational wing. If you don't see one with your name on it, and will I like some... Let Kathy know. Melissa Skinner is still working on the schedule for the children's chat and the extended session for 2023. If you'd like to be involved with that, let her know. Angel Tree gifts are due today. I'd like to thank everyone who was involved with that. West Virginia Baptist Newsletter subscri subscriptions are due. For renewal, and if you'd like to get a subscription, please let Kathy know in the church office. Here's one we do every year, the Christmas card exchange. There'll be a basket available in the entrance for you to drop your cards off and they will be given out at the end of the, right before Christmas. They'll have bags downstairs to put each individual one's in. If you brought an ornament for a tree and you don't have a tag for it, please let Kathy know. And we have a lot going on in December. December 5th, from 11 to 7, the Salvation Army will be ringing, our, will be ringing the bell at Shop and Save. <coughs> December 9th, of course, is at Senior Adult Luncheon. December 11th at 6 p.m., Christmas program. De December 18th at 5 p.m., there'll be Christmas caroling with soup and sandwiches afterwards. And then we'll end on the 24th at 6 p.m. with our Christmas Eve service. Operation Christmas Child, according to the bulletin, went very well. The National Collection Center was this last week. They donated 216 shoeboxes here at our church. 1,113 shoeboxes were, were at the Carson Center from throughout the county. They had a new drop-off that was in Jane Lou, and they collected 272 boxes. They brought us to a grand total for Lewis County of 1,385 boxes, which is very good. That'll, that many kids that will get a gift that will mean a lot to them. Today we'll continue through our, start our event season. There were several folks 
who received uh, dinners from our Thanksgiving dinner we had here at the church. And they wanted to say thank you to those who prepared it and delivered the meal. Kathy had one more to add. If next Sunday after church, they'll be taking more pictures. Uh, the different boards will be having their picture taken. And if anyone who hasn't had their picture taken would like it, you can get it done then. So let's have our time of greeting. All right, if you'll please stand, we'll sing page 31 in our little blue book, Emmanuel. be reading from Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 10. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. We are the followers of that root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and bear fruit worthy of repentance. That's Matthew chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 8. 
We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are a people rising towards God's promise, but we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement that there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer. Let's pray. Father, we can never sufficiently thank you that your son came to bring us peace with you through his death and resurrection. Thank you that he will rule in both peace and righteousness. Amen. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play. And mild and sweet, the song repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks a song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fall, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then ringing songs on its way. The world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Is there any prayer requests this morning? Okay. My call, okay. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your house this morning praising your name and thanking you for this beautiful day to come to your house and praise you. Lord, we just ask you to be with us this morning as we continue our service this morning and as our pastor brings us a message and then we celebrate your life with the Lord's Supper. Lord, we do ask for this year for peace on earth. Lord, there's a lot of people hurting, a lot of sick. We just pray that your hand will touch them and it be your will, whatever the case may be. Lord, we pray for the pray for our world. There's wars going, people fighting with each other. Please bring peace. And Lord, we just pray now that you'll bless each and every one of us this morning. That something said or done will touch our hearts. So let's pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, if you all please stand, we'll sing page 96, Away in a Manger.
again come to you thanking you for the day. Lord, we just ask now that you'll bless this offering that will be used for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity this morning to, to share together here in, in your house. And Father, we just thank you for the, your spirit that was here with us this morning. Father, we just pray that you would uh, be with us, that you would open our hearts and minds, that we might be receptive to you. And, and Father, we just, we just pray that you would free us that we might be able to to worship you and praise you with our our hearts and minds as well father as we lift you up and, and praise you for all of the all of your goodness to us father we thank you individually and we thank you for our families we thank you for your goodness to your church father we just pray that you would be with those that were mentioned here this morning we pray with uh, for those that are on our prayer list and, Father, those that are on our hearts, for those, Father, that only you know about within our, our church, within our families, within our community. Father, we just pray for healing. Father, we pray that you would just provide the, for the need that is in each, each situation, each family. We just pray that you would restore them that you would give them peace and comfort, that you would give the, the caregiver strength. Father, give them perseverance. Father, we, we thank you for this church and this time together. We thank you for this time to be able to praise you and to study your word. We, we pray that you would be with us in our Sunday school hour with each teacher, with each student. And Father, we just pray as we, we hear your word today and as we praise you with our song and our prayer, Father, that you would be glorified, that you would be pleased and know that we love you. Father, these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Thank you, choir. I noticed this morning that uh, a little different from last week. The the sun sun is out and shining through, and but it seems as you know, that although the sun is out and uh, compared to that gloominess of of last week, it, it seems like things inside are. Uh, I won't say gloomy, but a little subdued. It may be a little reflective this week uh, in our music, um, in our Advent lighting, in our reading. Uh, last week we you know, we looked at hope and, and peace, and uh, I just have to think, although there's there's not a lot of energy and excitement here on the outside, that each one of us could say that our hearts are glad this morning. Amen. It's it's good to to have uh, you here with us this morning. It really is. Um, I, as I prepared the sermon this week, and as I will continue to look over it last night, and and again early this morning, I uh, I just there was a, a different feeling in it this week, and uh, and that feeling has continued into into the uh, sanctuary here this morning. So it's not just me; it's it's I think it's you, and and I believe that's a part of the Holy Spirit as well. But we welcome you this morning, and uh, those that are on the live stream with us as well. I want to thank uh, our readers that have been a part of this the last two weeks, uh, the Skinners and the Kearns, and we've got uh, more uh, coming in the next two weeks, and, and all the excitement, all the different things going on in the church. I know you're aware of that. I won't uh, uh, go over that again, but uh, it is an exciting time for the, for the church. Remember our prayer list. There's a, a lot of needs within the church. Uh, continue to look at that daily and pray for those people. Continue to pray for one another, pray for your church, and, and pray for your pastor. This morning, we uh, we continue our walk through the, the book of Malachi. And uh, like I've told you before, you, you may get tired of this, but you, you're going to get tired for three more weeks after this. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, that'll take us up to Christmas, and and I promise we'll we'll leave it alone at, on Christmas morning for those who we we hope you can share with us on Christmas morning, and and we'll move into uh, the birth of our Savior. But uh, anyhow, for now we're looking at Malachi, and 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 I think we've seen some interesting things as we've looked uh, through the Book of Malachi. But our text today, uh, it begins with a presentation on the, the complaints of, of injustice uh, by the people of Judah. And, and then the prophetic response of God's promise of, of the coming judgment. And uh, we'll hopefully, uh, we'll see today how the wrath that is associated with God's judgment will, is going to do one of two things. God's judgment is going to do one of two things. It's either going to refine and purify the true follower of Christ, or it will consume the non-believer in the, in the day of judgment. But before we, we do get into our text this morning, I'd like to, to share a story with you like I, I often do. And uh, this is about a young man who's, who's facing the punishment um, for several crimes that he committed, and uh, he's he's been convicted of these crimes, and he's awaiting the the punishment. And as you as you listen to this story, I'm, I'm going to tell you, try to see any indication of mercy by the judge, and, and try to see how this might somehow re relate to our need for mercy in our relationship with God. Now this young man, he, he, he sat in the courtroom and, he, and his head was hanging low and, and his hands were hanging loosely at his side and, and he was, uh, he'd committed some pretty serious crimes and uh, his parents and family and, and all those who, who knew this young man were really shocked at what he had done and the jury had found him guilty of all charges 
And all that remained was for the, for the judge to pass sentence. And as the judge entered the courtroom, they, of course, they, they all rose to their feet. And, and then everyone returned to their feet. And this young man, he, he heard the words that he had been dreading to hear for so long. And that is the defendant will rise and, and face the court. And we're all going to rise and, and face the court one day. We're all going to sit in judgment. And the moment had come and he knew that his entire future now, now rested in the hands of, of the man that was stood in the, sitting in the seat before him. And, and the judge repeated the charges and he reiterated the findings of guilty uh, by the jury on each charge. And, and this young man, he winced every time a charge was read on the charge of aiding and abetting a criminal act involving transportation of stolen goods. The defendant has been found guilty. On the charge of evading an officer, the defendant has been found guilty. On the charge of possession of a firearm, the defendant has been found guilty. And the charges went on and on. And in total, there were six, six charges. And, and this young man, he, he heard these charges listed before him. And, and he thought, how would he ever be able to face his parents again, his friends? And particularly, how would he ever be able to face his girlfriend and then he thought, would the, would the judge be lenient? Was there a chance he would be lenient since he'd, he'd never been in trouble before? Would he receive prison time? And if he did, what, what would prison be like? And the judge rattled on and the scene in the, in the courtroom became a little surreal and almost like a bad dream. And he lifted his face towards the bench as the judge finished his recitation and he said, you have been found guilty. And the judge then paused and he brought his eyes directly into focus on the defendant. And he, as he began the sentencing, he said, I hope that you know the seriousness of what you have done. You have affected the lives of your parents and everyone who loves you. The law is very specific in, in demonstrating how serious your offenses are. The penalties it calls for in these circumstances are not lenient. However, this is your first offense. And I believe that you are truly sorry for what you have done. You have shown great remorse in the course of this trial and, and the character witnesses that were called in your defense, they, they all spoke highly of you. I have spoken with your parents and, and I have come to the conclusion that there will be no repeat behavior like this ever again. Therefore, I sentence you to one year of probation and 200 hours of community service. With those words, the young man suddenly felt this cooling sense of relief just come over his body from his head to his toes. But following these comforting words, the judge's merciful countenance slowly began to change. And with a stern look toward the, the young man, he added these words, It is my job to protect society from those who seek to harm her. It is also my job to to uphold the law and punish those who disobey that law, he then asked the young man to approach the bench. And the young man wondered if there was going to be additional punishment since the judge was deliberately writing something on a piece of paper and he folded it and he placed it in an envelope. And he said, young man, within this envelope are the penalties that I could have brought to bear against you. I want you to go home and I want you to read them over with your parents. And remember, even though it is my job to show mercy when I feel that it is warranted, if you disregard that mercy, I will be forced to do exactly what is written on this sheet of paper. It is now your job to make sure that my mercy will never be transformed into anger. 
mercy scorned translates into wrath realized. In our court system, but more importantly, mercy scorned translates into wrath realized in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you would, look at our text this morning. We'll begin in Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. And we'll read through chapter 3, verse 5. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, how have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or where is the God of justice? Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earners and his wages, the widow and the orphans, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. May God give us understanding in the reading of his word this morning. Our text, it opens with Malachi telling the people of Judah that they have, that they've wearied the Lord. They've had these cries of where is the God of justice? While their own lives are, are full of hypocrisy, they have these inverted morals and spiritual blindness, yet they demand justice. Does that sound familiar? Sounds an awful lot like today. Think maybe we have wearied the Lord recently as, as we cry out for God's justice and inverted morals. What used to be right is now wrong and what used to be wrong is, is now right. I think we see that a lot in today's society. These people lived their lives as if judgment would never occur. And basically what they were saying is, God will, Jesus will never come. There will never be a judgment. They didn't worry about it. And I think many people today are living their lives that they're saying the same thing. As we look at these scoffers in the, in the last day of the Jewish church prior to the, to the coming of the Messiah, we must consider the scoffers that exist today in the last days of the Christian church prior to the second coming of Christ. There's a, a lot of similarities the unbelief that exists today will, will have no effect on Christ's return, just like it had no effect on his birth. The promises of God stand for eternity. Unbelief is not going to stop them. In verse 1, God declares that he will send his messenger, John the Baptist, to prepare the way for the messenger of the covenant, which is Jesus Christ. 
And in the next two verses, Jesus' coming is described as a refiner's fire and fuller's soap. A refiner's fire is, is not for punishment, but rather for purification. There was a, a group of women who were doing a study on the book of Malachi. And you're probably asking after the last five weeks, why would they do that? <laughs> but they were. And as they began reading chapter 3, the, the chapter we are on today, they came across verse 3 which states, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Now this, this verse intrigued these ladies and they, they wondered what this statement really meant about the character and the nature of God. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. One of the women, she offered to, to look further into the process of, of refining silver and to get back with the group at the next study. And that week she, she contacted a silversmith. And she made an appointment to, to meet with him and just to, to watch him in his work. She did not mention anything about the reason for her interest in, in silver beyond her curiosity just to see how he went about his work in refining silver. As she watched the, the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and, and he let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the, in the middle of the flame where it, where it was the hottest in order to burn away all the impurities. And the woman thought about God holding us in, in such a way over the flame that, that she thought about the verse, he sits as a refiner and, and purifier of silver. And she asked the silversmith, she said, is it true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the, the whole time that the silver was being refined? And the man answered that yes, he, he not only had to sit there the entire time, holding that silver in the flame just precisely, but he also had to keep his eye on the silver. He had to keep his eye on the silver for the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was left even a, even a moment too long, it would be destroyed. And the woman was silent for a moment. And then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And he smiled at her and he answered, oh, that's easy. When I see my image in the silver. The refiner's fire is a biblical concept and it involves each one of us. We are all being refined through the refiner's fire. We, each one of us is, is called by God to, to be transformed into the image of Christ. We are called to be Christ-like. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Too often, we find ourselves in the fire. When we, when we find ourselves in the midst of our most difficult struggles of life, we, we think that God has turned from us. That maybe he doesn't love us anymore. Maybe we have finally sinned beyond God's reach. Maybe we finally sinned beyond anything his mercy and forgiveness could ever touch. When our battles seem to be unrelenting, when our battles just keep coming one after another and each one seems to be tougher than the previous, when we think we're doing all the right things in life, 
right? When, when we're praying regularly, when we're reading our Bible and we're meditating on God's Word, when we're giving our tithes, when we're attending church, but our situation just, it doesn't seem to get any better. And we think that God has, has somehow forgotten us. Or maybe worse yet, he sees our suffering, but yet he's just ignoring our cries. According to our text today, this is when God has us most fixed in his sight. When we're in the fire, that's when he has us in his vision. That's when he's looking at us the most. That's when he's protecting us the most. As he refines us in the fire, burning away all the impurities and the bad parts of our life, he has us clearly in focus, looking for the signs of our transformation. Because as, as he refines us and, and as he purifies us, we ultimately will be transformed into the, to the image of Christ. And that, that is the goal of each of us as a Christian, right? To become more like Christ each and every day. It is only when we have been refined by God in the image of Christ that we can present our worship and our offerings in a way that will be acceptable to God. It is only when we have been refined by God in the image of Christ that we can serve others, truly love others as Christ loved. As Christians, we are, we are continually refined by God because we are not perfect like Christ, as much as, we, as much as we may transform to look like Him, we will always have room for improvement, right? But, but what this means is that we are always under God's watchful eye. Always. Just like the silversmith who, who carefully watches his precious silver in the flame, allowing the heat to do the good, right? To, to take away the impurities, the bad things but never, never allowing it to, to harm us. Our last verse makes it clear to us this morning that, that not all will be refined by the fire. Many will be consumed by the fire at judgment. God says in verse 5 that he is eager to judge the doers of all kinds of wickedness. He says those who do not fear him will be judged. And these are the ones, these are the ones who will be consumed by the fire. If we look back at the, at the courtroom scene that I shared with you earlier, a good judge is always concerned first with the mercy and then with wrath. And that, my friends, is, is also how it is with our Savior Jesus Christ, who is first and foremost the merciful servant. His primary role is always a loving friend. In John 3:17. The Bible tells us that he, he did not come into this world to condemn, but to save. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Yet if, if you and I, if we don't submit to that mercy today, if we scorn his, his loving offer to, to bear our sins for us, he is left with no other alternative than to condemn us to the punishment that we deserve in the first place. The judgment of Christ will be harsh when there is no faithfulness on our part. 
If we reject the help and the comfort of Christ, there is no alternative to paying the price of our sin. If we reject God's mercy, hell is assured. Why? Why would anyone reject God's mercy? Why would anyone reject the love and sacrifice that Christ made for each one of us? Why would we resist the refining nature of God as he, as he works to transform our lives? In Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, it says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And there is that beautiful word that we all want, that word that we all need, hope. Hope this morning. Do you have hope this morning? Have you received God's transforming mercy into your life? Here in just a few minutes, we're, we're going to share in the Lord's table together. And as we, as we sing our hymn, I want you to take this time to, to reflect on your relationship with Christ. If there is something there that you aren't happy with, if, if there's something there that you aren't happy with and you know God isn't pleased with it, take a moment to share that today with God in prayer. And whether you come up front and pray or you do right, you pray right where you're at, it doesn't matter to God. But you need to take that to God today. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this mercy that I'm talking about this morning is available to you. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning, if he's beckoning you to, to give up your present ways, if he's beckoning you to, to come and have that hope this morning, I just pray that you will do that. Come and let me pray with you. Let's talk. If you have a burden on your heart this morning, and we all have burdens, and I pray that you give yours to God and you're able to, to let them go. But if you came here with a burden this morning that you just, you just can't, you can't quite let it go, today is the day to finally leave this place and leave it with God for good. As we stand and sing, Rescue the Perishing, if God is leading you to come and pray, I, I just ask that you do that today. And if not, pray for your brothers and sisters that are here. Please stand as we sing, Rescue the Perishing.
we prepare to, to share communion. I'll give those at home that may be sharing with us a moment to, to prepare their elements as well. We come to this table not because we must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you are sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and to pray for a spirit. And now that the supper of the Lord is spread before you, lift up your minds and hearts above all selfish fears and cares. Let this bread and this cup be to you the witness and signs of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Before the throne of the Heavenly Father and the cross of the Redeemer, make your humble confession of sin. Consecrate your lives to Christian obedience and service and pray for strength to do the holy and blessed will of God. Looking at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, beginning with verse 7. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Have the deacons, please.
Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many for the remission of sin. If you would, please join hands as we sing, Blessed Be the Time. Thank you. 